I have to apologize because I say less uh, about the uh, public uh, realm than I had uh, intended to, and perhaps less than you would think from the advertisement. It just it took me too long. I had uh, over 15,000 words, and as I've cut it, so I've cut it rather drastically. Uh, and I'd like to say that uh, uh, though uh, I paint a rather grim picture of universities uh, in this lecture, I've, I've been really lucky throughout my university life, from undergraduate uh, days to the present, to enjoy uh, with gratitude the very best things that universities uh, can offer. And that includes my present appointment, uh, for which I must thank, uh, firstly, uh, Glyn Davis, the Vice Chancellor, uh, and the uh, Dean of, who uh, was then Dean of the Law School, Michael Cremellan, and Mark Constantine for, for this appointment. Um, and uh, I'd like also to say how glad I am to be in this lecture theatre, renovated though it is, because uh, <laughs> I remember uh, the very many exciting lectures I heard here as an undergraduate uh, in the mid-60s to, mid, mid to late-60s, uh, mostly at, at lunchtime. Well, uh, before uh, uh, setting sail this evening on, on rather difficult waters, I want to explain why I chose the title of this lecture. In the early 1980s, Don Gunner, a philosopher here at the university, uh, told me that the task of the university is to civilise the city. Uh, and uh, when he said this, many academics still believed that the concept of university entitled them to say that no institution could rightly call itself a university if it didn't have a department of philosophy or classics or physics. They thought this was a conceptual truth, uh, one that would be evident after a thoughtful, historically educated reflection on the concept of university. And when Gunner told me that the task of the university is to civilise the city, uh, I worked, as I did until uh, till last year, at King's College London, which is situated on the Strand. And many of the great cultural institutions of London are within 15 minutes walking radius, so I didn't take what he said to be generally true of universities. I also thought it a very Australian, perhaps even Melbourneian uh, thing to say. Furthermore, academics were at the time beginning to describe what they were doing in managerial newspeak. And it seemed to me that rather than hoping that the kings would civilise the city around it, its academics might hope that the city might arrest its slide into philistinism. Managerial newspeak is, of course, a term of denigration, so I must explain what I mean by it and why I fully intend the denigration. It was inspired, I think, in the 80s by the belief that good managers could manage anything, provided that the activities of the institutions they managed could be suitably redescribed to enable them to do it. If, for example, you describe what students and their teachers achieve in a university as a product, students as customers, head of departments as unit managers, vice chancellors as, vice -chancellors as CEOs, and so on, then this thought goes, good managers from BHP should be able to take up management posts in universities, whether they have a rich understanding of the life of the mind or virtually no understanding of it at all. Many academics went along with it for at least two reasons, I think. Firstly, they thought that the descriptions of uh, uh, their work, such that it would become more tractable to management, would not impinge on their own sense of what they did. People act and activities can, after all, be described in different ways for different purposes. From the perspective of the university finance department, students can be described as customers. From the perspective of prospective, prospective employees, employers as products of a certain kind. And from the perspective of their teachers, simply as students. Many academics believe that for functional purposes, these different descriptions could be kept apart. Secondly, believing that they also believe that they could uh, forever keep an ironic distance from the managerial redescriptions of what they and their students did and of the relations between them. It was, it turns out, not surprisingly, hubris to think that they could retain their distance from those ways of speaking and even when it suited to ma ma manipulate those ways of speaking to outwit the managers, managers and the governments who paid their salaries. Though they were often alert, sometimes with an aggressive condescension to such hubris, 
when the military resorts to ugly euphemisms like collateral damage, or when governments deploy dehumanising descriptions of asylum seekers intentionally to diminish sympathy for them, the academics were blind to their vulnerability to the corrosive effects of managerial newspeak. Yet even in the early 80s, it should have been evident to anybody who had their eyes open that universities could more easily survive government cuts than they could survive the degraded language in which academics were beginning to speak of what they were doing. Managerial newspeak flourished and has taken a distinctive idiom and tone under an aggressive and ubiquitous free market ideology, but there is, I think, no reason to believe that it's essentially a product of such economics. It could flourish as well under socialist economies. Indeed, it emerged first in Britain under a Labour government before Margaret Thatcher came to power. And the instrumentalist conception of the value of university study that now dominates is equally at home on the left of politics as it is on the right. And in fact, it was the conservative political philosopher Michael Oakeshott who spoke most movingly against the managerialist impulses that were already showing in university administrations in the late 60s. Much of the student protest movement of the 60s, which many of my generation now romanticise as expressing an ideal period of university life, wanted the universities to serve the interests of the revolution, or at least those of social justice. The concern with the intrinsic value of academic study was often scorned, as the phrase was intellectual masturbation, and even subjects and disciplines, and sometimes whole disciplines, were hijacked to serve the radical cause. At Flinders University, for example, the course in moral philosophy was renamed American Imperialism in Vietnam. I imagine that was not what Don Gunner had in mind when he said that the task of the university is to civilise the city. But then I think that neither he nor I realised at the time that the concept of a university as a distinctive institution of higher education no longer had much life in it. It's no small matter the ubiquitous success of managerial newspeak and the characterisation of university life. Students who learn to speak it knowing no other language with which uh, they can understand what it can mean to be a student will not have the words with which to identify the deepest values of their education and so will not have the words to claim the treasure that constitutes their inheritance. An example might illustrate the point. Recently, when I gave a public lecture in the law school at this university, in which I lamented the ways that managerial newspeak had estranged politicians and civil servants, as much as school teachers and academics, from the deepest values of their vocations, a student said at question time that he didn't object to being described as a customer in his dealings with his teachers. In fact, he went on to say he welcomed us because it enabled him to hold them to account if they didn't deliver the products that the university had advertised. Students have justification for feeling aggrieved, perhaps especially in the more prestigious universities where pressures on research performance is highest and where inevitably academics are torn between giving time to their students and writing papers and applying for grants and so on. My intention in saying that is not to lay blame on the universities. It's simply to describe things as it seems to me they presently are. Universities are, are under intolerable pressure to produce research results as a sign of productivity and as markers of prestige, and at the same time to respond to the increasing demands that teachers be more accountable to their students. Managers will therefore say, with some reason, that their task, not yet accomplished, is to find the right balance between the time given to teaching and to research. The metaphor of the balance is often irresistible in such circumstances, but it can be misleading. Whether it be in politics, when people speak of getting the balance right between liberty and security, for example, or in our present discussion, the metaphor tends to obscure the fact that there are no value-neutral ways of describing what goes onto the scales and how they weigh, or perhaps even more accurately, what weighing comes to in this context. When I teach students who read philosophy, I often tell them that I don't set the most important of the standards in whose light they should see what they do, nor does the department or the university. 
My colleagues and I try with them, the students, to rise to the standards of the discipline which are set by the works of the great figures in it and also by those like Nietzsche and Wittgenstein who had a tense relation to the academic practice of it and those like Socrates for whom philosophy was not and could not have been a discipline. What I say to them relies, of course, on a sense of the intrinsic import worth of what they're doing. More importantly, in itself and to my point, is that it requires a continuing, ever-deepening exploration of what worth of that kind means, of what it can be to do philosophy for the love of it, and of the joys and the obligations that that love imposes. More often than not, we academics must acknowledge that we fail ourselves and our students when we judge what we do by those standards, but we would fail our students even more seriously if we didn't make them and ourselves answerable to those standards. Obviously, the limited family of concepts to which that of a customer and a provider of goods and services belong will not take us far in the direction of understanding what's at issue here, nor will the metaphor of getting the balance right enable us to understand the disagreements about the deepest values of the academic life and of what it is to do history or philosophy or physics, for example, well, or sometimes, as in the case of philosophy, what it is to do it at all. I suppose that the, students in my, the student in my example welcome being described as a customer because customers know, or can set out to know, how to demand value for money. Customers typically know what they want and what counts as getting it. The trouble, however, as I hope my example shows, is that students are initiated into things that they don't understand and which take time to understand. And if they're well taught, they discover worlds they have never dreamed of, whose exploration requires disciplines which at their deepest can never adequately be captured in the forms they fill out at the end of the semester to assess their lectures and their lecturers. When we describe students as customers, we don't create a suitable form for them to hold their teachers to account. We make many of their teachers servile because they become fearful. The concept of a university as going to appeal to it is now defunct. No institutions that call themselves universities from the most to the least academically distinguished think seriously of what they do under that concept. No academic managers, managers, I'm sure, feel the need to consider whether the courses they would introduce or acts are consistent with a serious conception of the university. The protest that one cannot have a university without philosophy or classics or physics, for example, falls on deaf, deaf ears or provokes the irritated response I heard from a minister uh, of education in Britain not too long ago told repeatedly at a meeting that you can't have a university without a philosophy department, he said at a certain point, well, all right, in that case, we'll call it something else. <laughs> Does it matter? Has something important been lost? And even if there has been, is there point in lamenting its loss since perhaps its time had come? Should we not then get the balance and uh, balance the losses against the gains? And to those questions, I answer yes and no. The English philosopher Michael Dummett asked recently whether if philosophy had developed only 50 or so years ago, would we ever have thought that no institution could justifiably call itself a university if it didn't nourish a flourishing department of philosophy? He might have asked the same question of most of the disciplines in a university, and the answer would have been the same. We would not have thought that they were necessary to a serious understanding of what it is for an institution to be a university. The rhetorical point of Dummett's question is, of course, to suggest that the claim that an institution could not justifiably call itself a university unless it had a philosophy department disguised an historical accident as a conceptual truth. He might have gone on to say that it often goes with a fantasy about a golden age of university life, and though he would not, others would go on to say that such fantasies are the expression of elitist nostalgia. Well, all that may be a fair response to the way that some, perhaps many, people who defended the concept of a university as an institution that was home to a distinctive form of the intellectual life put their defences. 
And it's true enough that one must look backwards to discover when the concept of university rent, re represented a moving and inspiring ideal. But when one does that, one need not look to institutions and practices that one believes actually measured up to the concept. And one need only look to a time when their practices were judged to be answerable to it. Nor need one look for something like the platonic form of the university. The best thinking about the university was not about a platonic form of it. It was thinking that was inward with the distinctive form of the life of the mind that universities nourished, thought in dialogue with a history of reflection that goes back at least to Socrates. It was that historical depth rather than the idea of a metaphysical essence or nostalgic <coughs> allegiance to a historical paradigm that ensured fertile reflection upon the concept of university and on one historically quite accidental form of the life of the mind, the academic form. And that same quite contingent historical depth also secured for the concept some distance from times and places to make it possible for thinkers to judge, whether they're right or wrong doesn't matter to my point, to judge that their desires, their purposes, their aspirations, and even the spirit of their times were faithful or faithless to the idea of university, which though expressed in the singular, was of course never just one thing. This is thought of a kind that may deepen without limit and that can never be exhausted by a set of definitions. To the student who thought he was empowered by being described as a customer, I would emphasize that this kind of reflection of what it is to be a teacher or a student in a university requires inwardness with, a, with, with values slowly apprehended through living the life of the mind in a community with fine exemplars of it. And as I said a moment ago, it can awaken desires we never had in responses to values we had never before encountered. The dialogical interdisciplinary enactment of that reflection constituted what used to be called a community of scholars with all the unworldly connotations that expression rightly evokes. And I want now to try to show why I think that the obligations that define that community yielded a concept of the university as, as a home for the academic form of a distinctive, sorry, home for the academic form of the life of the mind and the intellectual life more generally. And I'll do it by commenting on the most radical challenge to that form of the life of the mind that I know. It comes from a speech by Callicles, a character in one of Plato's dialogues. And he begins his speech with this challenge to Socrates. He says, come now, Socrates, are you serious or are you joking? Because if you're serious, the whole of human life is turned upside down. And Callicles goes on to say, I quote this at some length. It's a good thing to engage in philosophy just so far as it's an aid to education and no disgrace for a youth to study it. But when a man who's now growing older studies philosophy, it becomes ridiculous, Socrates. When I see a youth engaged in it, I admire it and it seems to me a natural, it seems to me to be natural and I consider such a man ingenious and the man who does not pursue it I regard as illiberal and one who will never aspire to any fine or noble deed. But when I see an older man studying philosophy and not deserting it, that man, Socrates, is actually asking for a whipping. Such a man, even if he's exceptionally gifted, is doomed to prove less than a man, shunning the city centre and the marketplace in which the poet said, men win distinction. He'll spend the rest of his life sunk in a corner and whispering with three or four boys and incapable of any utterance or deed that's free and lofty and brilliant." End of quote. When I read Callicles' speech to students, they smile knowingly because they think they've got the measure of him. They tend to think he's a Philistine. In their hearts, however, most of them agree with him, as I believe do most of their parents and perhaps even some of their teachers. If one leaves aside for a moment his claim that the continued study of philosophy is demeaning to an older person, 
then what Callicles says in appreciation of the worth of philosophical study is a good statement of what most students and their parents seek in what they call a liberal education and what many people would hope for if they hoped that the university would civilise the city. He doesn't offer an extrinsic justification for the importance of philosophical study by the young. He praises it for cultivating certain qualities of mind, an imaginative appreciation of and concern for what's fine and noble, which is presumably conditional upon an absorption in the subject for its own sake. He believes that the study of philosophy for its own sake is necessary to a certain kind of personal cultivation. The pursuit of sweetness and light is not an expression one would expect to hear from Callicles, although he would applaud the pursuit of excellence. But he thinks, as Matthew Arnold sometimes does, that the chief good of study for its own sake is the cultivation of a culturally refined, a culturally refined urbanity. Callicles will also agree that the study of philosophy tended to make its students more thoughtful citizens, or he could agree, could agree with that. And he could also agree with much of what, what philosophers say by way of extrinsic justification for their discipline. And for those reasons, he might acknowledge the need of good... Well, he not, not might, would acknowledge, must acknowledge the need of good teachers of philosophy. He'd not grant, however, because he would not find intelligible that a life devoted to philosophical study, or to put it more generally, a life lived in a love of truth, could be a life worthy of a noble spirit. Perfectly aware, if only because of Socrates' example, that philosophy could inspire an absorption that lasted a lifetime, he denies only that it's a worthy absorption. His praise of Socrates is quite serious as far as it goes. And if we find that hard to believe, it's because we find it hard to reconcile such praise with his contempt for those who believe that the life of the mind could worthily inspire a lifelong devotion. But therein lies the seriousness of his challenge. The point might be more apparent if one reflects on the dramatic decline in the prestige of school teaching over the last 40 or 50 years. Ambitious and well-educated parents often want good schools and therefore good teachers for their children, but God forbid, many of them think, that any of their children should become school teachers. Teachers are losers, I hear many of their bright children say, as they work hard to get the marks that would earn them a place in prestigious medical or law schools. And I don't think they think much differently about academics. The acknowledgement by academics in a university of an obligation to reflect, to reflect critically on the example of scholars and teachers who spend a lifetime sunk in a dark corner to find the community of scholars as I've spoken of it. That obligation on academics and university goes with another, to try to make authoritatively living in their practice an adequate response to Callicles when he challenged Socrates to show that a lifelong, lifelong devotion to the life of the mind could be worthy of any human being who has more than mediocre aspirations. The value of the life of the mind, what it can humanly mean can only be revealed in the reflective appreciation of the way it deepens the lives of people who care for it. We don't have a sense of it independently of such exemplars. Socrates, not the historical Socrates, but the character in Plato's dialogues, developed various arguments to respond to Callicles. But Plato gave us the character to show what a life committed to philosophy can mean. And it's the character, at least as much as the arguments he developed, that has haunted Western culture. If you want to know what justice is, you must look to the just man, said Aristotle. But of course, you have to have eyes to see. The same is true of our understanding of the life of the mind in all its forms. Or to change the metaphor for a better one, examples will inspire us only if they speak to us in a language that lives for us. That's why Plato, the poet, is as important as, and indeed inseparable from, Plato, the philosopher. By the same token, the language that reveals value of any depth depends on examples to make it vital. I hope that it's evident, even to someone who thinks that they deserve the hostility directed to them at present, that the humanities play a fundamental role in the critically reflective dialogue that constitutes the community of scholars, as I spoke of it earlier. <coughs> 
I've no desire to revive the two cultures debate here this evening. Discussion of the place the humanities needs to be rescued from the assumptions that informed that debate, almost as much as it needs to be rescued from the poisonous inanities of the culture wars. The fundamental impact of science on our understanding of what it means to be human is undeniable. It has deepened immeasurably our understanding of ourselves as creatures of the earth and as material beings in the universe. Neuroscience has altered our understanding of the mind and the evolutionary psychology has had considerable influence on moral psychology and through it on moral and political philosophy. And of course, recent developments in technology have not only affected our lives directly in dramatic ways, but they've also altered our ways of thinking about and imagining ourselves. Self-evidently, scientists live the life of mind as surely as their colleagues in the humanities. Some years ago, in a program on the origins of the universe, the BBC revealed this beautifully to a non-specialist audience. The program went on for over four hours, and though I could hardly understand a word of it, I was glued to the television for the duration. I was inspired, indeed exhilarated, by the joyful love of the world, mediated in this case by a love of its beauty, shown by those high-flying astrophysicists. It gave me a new and deepened understanding of what the study of science can mean in a human life and of what it can be to pursue it for the love of it. Or more accurately, uh, it made me understand why Simone Weil was right to say that it can be misleading to speak of the love of truth and that we should speak instead of the spirit of truth in love. Nonetheless, only when they're engaged with the humanities are the natural sciences able to continue, uh, sorry, to contribute to an understanding of the human meaning of their discoveries, indeed of their meaning, period. Only engaged with moral, legal and political philosophy, historically informed and imaginatively engaged with art, can evolutionary theory, for example, deepen our understanding of the human condition. And... <coughs> However much it may be, indeed must be, informed by examples like the one I gave from the BBC, reflection on the value of truth, what it is to work in the spirit of truth in love, as those astrophysicists did, is reflection suited especially to the humanities. But the critical distance from the times, from convention and fashion, that the humanities require to honour their obligation to the need that we human beings have to understand ourselves, that critical distance is undermined by the present conditions of academic life. Academics now tend to cut their subjects down to size that is tractable enough for them to meet the demands of accountability. Impressive te technicality, a kind of high-flying thoughtlessness can shine in such circumstances. And this is true even in philosophy, which glories, but increasingly without justification, in the fact that radical self-criticism is of its essence. Wittgenstein suggested that philosophers should greet one another by saying, take your time. One needs time to muse and to meditate. Thinking of this kind doesn't issue quickly in publications and is often not sure of itself. It's seldom impressive on its feet. Yet for those of us who are not geniuses, it nourishes critical reflection enabling one sufficient space and time to step back and to examine assumptions one might otherwise not even have noticed. And just as the emphasis on high-flying research performance undermines critical reflection, so it undermines teaching in the hum humanities even more obviously. Even academics who work in the best departments in the best universities seldom produce work that's read by more than a handful of colleagues before it gets forgotten. Yet for such mediocre achievement. They cut corners in their teaching by assigning more of it to postgraduates, by increasing the numbers in tutorials to ridiculous levels, and by seeing students less often, for example. Many of them would be fine and some would be wonderful teachers, thus doing more for their students than they can do by writing and more for their discipline. One could weep for the waste. Perhaps worst of all, the way that universities now distinguish research active academics from those who are not leaves little space for those who write little and have not attracted grants 
but who are up to date with their disciplines and whose reflective engagement with them makes their contribution to the intellectual life of their department or schools invaluable. In that way, they also contribute to the research culture of their department or school. Don Gunner was such a scholar, as were many of the people who taught me in this university. As much as people who write books and refereed articles, academics like them, genuine scholars and thinkers, though not researchers in the contemporary narrow meaning of the term, need time free of teaching to be the inspiring teachers and colleagues that they are. Yet the descriptions of what they do that are implicit, though obvious, in the research requirements common in most universities denigrate what they have to offer and humiliates them, I might add. Because the institutions we call universities are in complex ways socially, politically and historically embedded, it would be foolish to suggest that one could adequately characterise how they are and how they've come to be that way solely by philosophical elaboration of the decline of an idea. The idea of a university had life when there were fewer universities. That's just a fact. When their number increased dramatically, institutions that uncontroversially could lay no claim to it were granted the title university. And when I say they could lay no serious claim to the title, I'm not commenting on the quality of the work that was done in them. I mean only that they were not institutions that ever th had ever thought of themselves as answerable to the conceptual truths that define the idea of a university, true to the kind that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. It therefore became impossible for any of the universities to, to, to define themselves in an ever-deepening exploration of those truths. And that will not change. On this matter, there's no going back. Insofar as university education, in part, was defined by the fact that it's acquired by living in a community that's continuously answerable to the obligation to reflect on what it means to be a student or a teacher, responsive to those truths, that defined the deepest and most rigorous standards in their disciplines. Then the upshot of the expansion of the university sector is not that many more people enjoy university education, it's that nobody does. And this is but one of the many examples, bitter ironies indeed, <coughs> in which the entirely justified and indeed morally compelling pressure of egalitarianism eroded the very nature of the institutions to which it demanded broad and equal access. The bitter irony in the case of the universities is that the distinction between the most and the least prestigious has reasserted itself with nothing like the now defunct concept of university to restrain, restrain its more baleful consequences. Whether things could have developed differently is something I won't go into here. But if it would be foolish to talk of the radical change in the institutions called universities over the last 40 years or so without addressing the social and political circumstances of that change, it would be equally foolish to think that one could characterise the plight of the universities, let alone understand it, without understanding the values that distinguish universities from other institutions of higher education and that determine the character of the disciplines within them. And that means we can't characterise or explain the plight of the universities without understanding, amongst other things, but crucially, how they've become dominated by a largely instrumental conception of their nature. Whatever understanding we achieved about that will be, in considerable part, the work of history and social theory. But the offerings of those disciplines will not take us far unless they're informed by an imaginative conceptual grasp of what that instrumental ideal has replaced, has displaced. And that will in its turn depend on inwardness with the life of the mind, lived in pursuit of understanding for its own sake, an inwardness that requires sympathy for the joys and obligations of that life. And need I say that the fruits of such inwardness cannot be expressed in managerial newspeak. But to avoid misunderstanding, let me acknowledge straight away and without any reluctance whatsoever the vocational and professional causes have always been important to universities. Never before, however, did they determine the idiom, set so much of the tone, transform the language and set the goals of the institutions to whose essential identity, if not to their attractions and prestige, they had previously been marginal. For a very long time, the humanities have had to establish their credentials against the prestigious claims to knowledge 
justifiably advanced by the sciences and against the attractions of the professional courses, vocational courses as they're now called. Only recently, however, has the need to attract outside funding and the self-evident attractions of courses that will guarantee secure employment so radically transformed the ways that institutions of higher education that are called universities understand what they are. So great is that transformation, so complete the success of managerial newspeak, that as I remarked earlier, some of the essential disciplines of the humanities and the sciences, philosophy and even physics, for example, in some universities, have become mendicants for a respected place in institutions that should honour them, but instead honour the study of hospitality and gaming. A British Minister of Education said a few years ago that although he had nothing against people who wanted to study classics, he didn't see why the state should pay for them to do it. Though I was surprised that he said it, I wasn't surprised that he thought it. Many people do. He thought that none of the instrumental virtues of a classic education, or instrumental benefits of a classic education, could justify its expense, and that the state should not pay for the non-instrumental pleasures that it afforded. Academics everywhere are hard-pressed to defend the intrinsic value of their disciplines to their paymasters. Some conceptions of intrinsic value go deep. Others, however, are relatively shallow. Expressions like for its own sake or for its intrinsic value mean something only in the context of a common understanding of how to characterise more positively and fully the value of something pursued, as we say, for its own sake. When such common understanding is absent, those expressions often convey the vague thought that something that should not be pursued only for the instrumental value is pursued, in fact, for that value. Or they convey something very thin, like the idea of a higher pleasure, of the kind to which John Stuart Mill resorted when he tried to explain why the life of, a so of Socrates dissatisfied was preferable to the life of a pig satisfied. We have for a long time, I think, been bereft of such a common understanding, one that would enable us to give authoritative voice to a conception, positive and deep, of the value of academic forms of the life of the mind. I have a passion for philosophy, and until back trouble set in, I had it for mountaineering too. Both yield higher pleasures, but quite rightly, the taxpayer pays only for one. If the intrinsic value of university studies is nothing more serious than the pleasures that accompany the disciplined exercise of the powers of the mind, then it's right that serious people should look to their extrinsic benefits, be they political or economic. The reason that we find it difficult to argue persuasively for a more serious conception of the intrinsic value of academic study is not because Philistines dominate our audience nor is it because of the effects of high unemployment on students or the effects of market-driven policies on staff and courses. Such economic and political factors are important, but their impact on the universities is as much effect as it is cause of our inarticulacy. In the 60s, the universities were vulnerable, as I reminded you earlier, to the call that they serve the requirement of political idealism. They are now vulnerable to the pressure to serve the economic imperatives of the nation. In both cases, their vulnerability had been partly a function of the fact that those who defended them, sometimes passionately, could rarely articulate a vision of the life of the mind that would move people to see something serious and deep where they had not seen it before. It went together with the loss of the concept of a university as something more than a high-flying institution three stages past kindergarten, which excels at research. This is a cultural phenomenon, a quite general conceptual loss, and has little, do, little to do with individual failings of character or intelligence. The concepts we need are beyond our reach in the way that we capture when we say that a form of speaking has gone dead on us. Thus, for example, the spread of managerial newspeak was facilitated by the replacement of the idea of an academic life as a, by the replacement of the idea of academic life as a vocation with the idea of it as a profession. At a certain point, the concept of a vocation became as anachronistic as the concept of chastity. And when that happened, 
Our sense of the value of truth and its place in the characterization of ac academic life changed. What one makes of talk of the love of truth, of truth as a need of the soul, of the need to be concerned with truth, either vanity or wealth or status and so on, will be different according to whether one's conception of ac academic life and its responsibilities is structured by the concept of a vocation or whether it's structured by that of a, a profession or even of a career. In his notebooks, Wittgenstein agonizes over whether his work is infected by vanity. Infected, I think, is the right word, or polluted might be, because he was not worried that vanity would increase the number of mistakes that he made, or in other ways distort the content as we think of the content of his philosophy when we lecture on him, on the private language argument or on rule following, for example. For him, the spirit in which philosophy was done was intrinsic to its nature. Seen in the light of the conception of a philosophical life, including an academic philosophical life as a vocation, that is perhaps not remarkable. But in the light of a conception of that life as a profession or a career, it's likely to seem precious or neurotic. And everybody would acknowledge that it would be absurd to characterise Socrates as a great professional. And they know that's not because the option was not available to him at the time. But it would not be absurd to say that when he said under the threat of death that he could not give up philosophizing because the unexamined life is not worthy of human being, that he expressed what he took to be an ethical necessity intrinsic to his sense of philosophy as his vocation. It's true that philosophy was not an academic discipline for Socrates and Wittgenstein, as I said earlier, had a complexly tense relation to the discipline. But though the expression academic philosopher and professional philosopher are now virtually interchangeable, it was not always so. I want now to turn briefly to something that seems implicit in Gunnar's statement about the role of the universities, namely that academics have an obligation to participate in discussion beyond the academy. It would of course be absurd to claim that this is true of all academics merely by virtue of the fact that they are academics. And though I will not argue the matter this evening, there is no justifiable description, I think, of a university academic, even those working in, say, political theory or political philosophy, from which one can generate an obligation to take part in the kind of public discussion that is now identified as conducted by people who are called, it's an ugly expression I know, public intellectuals. More narrow descriptions of them as employers of the state might, of course, generate obligations to contribute expertise of one kind or another, but that's another matter. Leaving obligation aside, would it be a good thing if academics were more generally involved in public discussion? For any given period of time, the answer, I think, will depend on the state of the academy and of the disciplines within it. To take just philosophy as an example, we're not contemplating now the platonic form of philosophy, an eternal form outside of history, but philosophy as an academic discipline practiced in universities at particular times and in particular cultures. One answer, therefore, to the question, would it be good if philosophy were to be more involved in the public arena, would depend partly on how one judges the state of the discipline at that time. Sometimes a discipline is in decline because of reasons internal to it, or because of external pressures that undermine the kind of reflectiveness that can protect philosophy and other disciplines against conformity, not to mention fashion. And when it's in decline, especially if it has succumbed to pressures that undermine radical self-criticism, let alone radical criticism of public policy, then philosophy's entry into the public life by means of various ethics committees, for example, is likely to be less than edifying. That said, when people for whom philosophy matters judge rightly or wrongly at any historical moment that philosophy is in bad shape, they will hope that it will flourish again and engage in public discussion without doing more harm than good. However bad it may be for a public intellectual culture to have bad philosophy, it's worse, I believe, but I know this is disputable, worse for it to have none at all. And despite the relatively recent and welcome addition of philosophers to the guest list at writers' festivals, philosophers have had a negligible impact on public discussion in Australia. 
hardly ever is a relatively serious book of philosophy reviewed in the literary pages of the newspapers or even in the literary magazines. Gunnar made his remark at a time uh, when Australian intellectuals and academics, many of them at any rate, were estranged from ordinary Australians. Australia seemed to them at the time, this is especially when he was intellectually formed in the 50s and early 60s, a cultural desert. Many fled at that time, mostly to England. Then none would have dreamed of living in a country town. Now, of course, it's different. Melbourne intellectuals follow Australian rules football. They live in country towns, go to writers' festivals, and writers' festivals and, uh, and festivals of ideas and public lecture series have, of course, flourished all over the land. At the same time, however, universities have retreated from the public realm, largely under the pressures of accountability, especially over research. Even interdisciplinary work within universities, regarded as desirable a few years ago, even a plus on applications for research grants, is now discouraged because publication in disciplines other than one's own will not earn points for one's department. If you're a philosopher who has contributed to a book of essays on a novelist or a poet, for example, your department won't thank you for it, nor will the Department of Literature, because it gets no credit. And the narrow conception of and focus on research discourages, indeed implicitly disparages, engagement with cultural institutions outside the university, unless that engagement is narrowly professional, the provision of expertise of one kind or another. Thus, while philosophers, to take them uh, as an example again, might be encouraged to sit on various kinds of ethics committees and to write for refereed journals of practical philosophy, they're now discouraged. I mean, the practice in the institution discourages them from giving public lectures, speaking at writers' festivals, publishing in non-refereed journals, and even, I know this is hard to believe, but pinch yourself because it's not a dream, even for writing books rather than publishing in A-grade referee journals. <coughs> Some years ago, I argued at the Melbourne Writers' Festival to an entirely unconvinced Ramona Caval that writers' festivals and the broader literary culture focus too much on good writing with a capital W and not enough on good thinking or thinking at all, for that matter. <laughs> Some people say uh, that where there is good writing, there is also good thinking, but that's just not true except perhaps at the very highest level. Anybody who has read my work will know that I do not need to be convinced of the importance of art to our understanding of what it is to be human, especially not uh, of the importance of literature. But in the absence of any serious engagement with the various discursive modes of thought characteristic of the academic disciplines, the kind of emphasis on good writing and on storytelling that writers' festivals and even festivals of ideas promulgate will, I think, contribute to a new kind of anti-intellectualism, perhaps even a new kind of philistinism. And that, that uh, such a form of anti-intellectualism has taken hold in our culture, shows itself in a fact, Robert Mann first made me aware of the extent of it, that, that so few people who are engaged in public discussion feel the need now actually to respond to criticism by way of anything that looks like sustained, rigorous argument which means we no longer regard ourselves as seriously answerable to one another for what we say in cultural and political debate. How might that be different? I'd like to spend more time trying to answer that, but I have, I'll just sketch it in the little time that I have by way of an example. A couple of years ago, Bernhard Schlink uh, gave one of two keynote addresses at the Melbourne International Writers' Festival. He's the author of The Reader, a best-selling novel that was adapted to film, uh, one that earned Kate Winslet an Academy Award. Schlink is also a professor of legal philosophy in Germany. In that capacity, he spoke at the Melbourne Town Hall about his book, developed from lectures at Oxford, Guilt About the Past. The festival screened The Reader. Afterwards, Schlink spoke about the film, his novel and the book, on which he had lectured a night or two earlier. And the thing common to all three was how to respond clear-sightedly, politically, but more importantly, morally, to the discovery that someone you love and admire is guilty of the crimes that defined the Holocaust, or was in one of many possible ways 
complicit in them. Some thought highly of what Schlink did at the festival, others didn't, but I have no doubt that the kind of thing, kind of thing he did was a marvellous illustration of the way that literature speaks to us against the backgrounds of a shared understanding formed by other arts and by more discursive modes of thought, in this case the philosophy of law. Only against, the back, only against that background can a work of literature find its voice and only against it will its readers form an educated critical voice with which to respond to it. By inviting such a range of critical voices into the conversation that constitutes that shared understanding that we call culture, a writer's festival can play an important role in the way that citizens are able to think and to imagine themselves. But then, of course, if they do that, they'll be doing in a wider community what, in a slightly different way, the community of thinkers and artists in a university should anyhow be doing. When academics do enter the public domain, engaging with an educated, well-read, hard-thinking public, they do it best, I think, if they, give, if, they go beyond, if they go beyond their capacity to give expert advice. They do it best, I think, as citizens in critical conversation with other citizens. Of course, it will show that they're academics of this or that kind, but the public conversational space I have in mind is one in which nobody takes for granted that even very good philosophers, historians, literary critics, physicists, evolutionary biologists and so on will contribute only for the good. Even distinguished moral philosophers, after all, may speak from the perspective of, of narrow lives and narrow reading outside of their lives and even within philosophy. And as often as not, they may offer a narrow conception of what counts as rigorous thinking. In closing now, I'll return to the student who welcomed being described as a customer. Had I thought of it at the time, I would have recommended to him an essay by Hannah Arendt. It's called The Crisis in Education and was written in the 1950s, published in a collection of her essays entitled Between Past and Future. She writes, and I quote, Education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it and by the same token save it from that ruin which, except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and young, would be inevitable. And education too is where we decide whether we love our children enough, not to expel them from our world and to leave them to their own devices, not to strike from their hands their chance of undertaking something new, something foreseen by no one, but to prepare them in advance for the task of renewing a common world. Arendt's remarks are, I think, a fine statement of the public duties of a university. When a university provides students with a space that protects them from the pressures of the world, from worldliness in one of the many senses of that word, and from the pressures that conspire to make them children of their times, in the pejorative sense of that expression, then it fulfills its primary public obligation compared to which any obligation that academics may have to engage with a broader culture outside the university or with politics is secondary. It's a space in which students are invited to form new desires and ideals in the light of values they had probably not dreamed of and certainly never before fully understood. The unworldly connotations of the expression a community of scholars should not be a source of embarrassment. If I've succeeded in making that plausible, then I will also have made plausible that there is a need, an obligation, to preserve the unworldly space in which university teachers are able to reveal to their students what it means most deeply to devote one's life to an academic vocation. They will then reveal to their students, who will go into the world to live many different kinds of lives, a kind of value in their education very different from the kind of value that people often speak of when they speak of a liberal education. Perhaps that's what Don Gunner, after all, or something like that perhaps, is what Don Gunner, Don Gunner, <laughs> Don Gunner had in mind. Thank you. <laughs>